Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, as we begin consideration of this important legislation, the House is not in order. The House will come to order. Recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, as we begin consideration of this important legislation, all of us in this chamber want to pay tribute to the men and women of our armed forces, all volunteers. They deserve our heart heartfelt thanks for their incredible service and sacrifices and that of their families. And everything we do over the next few days should be dedicated to them. My colleagues, the fiscal year 2015 Department of Defense Appropriations Bill was reported out unanimously by the full committee on June 10th. This recommendation is a product of countless staff hours, 10 official briefings, and 13 hearings. Most of our hearings related to assuring success in reducing risk for our warfighters and their mission. It is worth noting that one of these hearings was exclusively dedicated to taking testimony from members of the House on their views, opinions, and priorities for this year's Defense Appropriations Bill. I want to thank those members who took time to inform and educate the committee, as well as other members who made specific requests. At the onset, I'd also like to thank Chairman Hal Rogers and Ranking Member uh, Lowy for their support of our committee's work. As they know, this bill is a product of a bipartisan and cooperative effort, for which I thank my good friend, the Ranking Member Pete Vesklowski. He has been a valuable partner throughout this whole process, and thanks to all members of the committee and to our incredible staff. The base funding recommendation is $491 billion, which is $202 million above the President's request and $4.1 billion above last year's enacted level. As many members are aware, the committee has not yet received the President's recommendations for the overseas contingency operations. The OCO budget is as known, so we're forced to in include a uh, $79.4 billion placeholder in our legislation. Our committee operates in a completely transparent and accountable manner, so clearly this is not the way we wanted to proceed to the floor with no details, no context, no facts for those accounts. We've pressed the administration at every opportunity to get us the OCO plan. The administration has told us for months that it is finalizing its plan for the enduring U.S. military presence in Afghanistan, which will have a serious impact on the size of that funding request. Well, three weeks ago, the President announced his plans for U.S. troop levels in Afghanistan beyond this year. The Army and Marines have already closed down bases and removed tons of equipment. Still, we have no request and are forced to debate a placeholder of nearly $80 billion. While the Afghan presidential elections are still unsettled, the leading candidates support the bilateral security agreement, supposedly the anchor for this funding request. So what's the holdup? We need to get on with it. And I have to say that many people find it just a bit bizarre that the administration has proclaimed its opposition to the bill yesterday when they have failed to do their job and lay out their ga game plan for overseas operations. But whatever the recommendations we ultimately receive, we will closely examine their request because we still have troops and civilians on the ground, and no matter the number, they need to be protected. Of course, we'll also consider the deepening war and conflict in Iraq, the continuing disintegration of Syria, the aggressiveness of Russia in Eastern Europe and China in the Pacific, the growing influence of Iran, increased terrorist attacks around the globe, especially in Africa. So while the administration feels the pending OCO request will have a great deal to do with our enduring U.S. presence in Afghanistan, in reality, the request will have a great deal to do with our enduring role in the fight to protect Americans, our homeland, from a growing list of global threats. Even though we've returned to regular order this year, the committee faced many challenges in crafting this year's defense bill. But we've held firm to two guiding principles, ensuring that our men and women in uniform have the resources they need to defend our nation and support their families, and secondly, 
ensuring that the Department of Defense and our intelligence community have the resources they need to carry out their mission in the most efficient and effective manner. Our goal throughout this bill is to support our warfighters now and in the future whenever the next crisis arises. At the same time, our committee clearly recognizes the nation's debt crisis. and We found areas and programs where reductions were possible without, without adverse impact. Finally, it's important to note that we make every dollar count without harming readiness or increasing risks incurred by our warfighters. The bill before you attempts to meet those responsibilities within current fiscal restraints while leaving no question for our allies and adversaries about our will and our ability to defend ourselves and our interests around the world. America must continue to lead, and this bipartisan bill enables that. Let me highlight just a few items briefly included in this fiscal year defense appropriation request. An additional $1.2 billion to fill readiness shortfalls, $530 million to fully fund the authorized $1.2 8 percent pay raise for our troops, $780 million to begin re the refueling of the USS George Washington, a vital power protection platform, $5.8 billion for a total of 38 Joint Strike Fighters, $970 million to buy 12 additional growlers, attack growlers, $120 million to upgrade the M1 Abrams tanks, $350 million for the very important Israeli cooperative program an additional 20, 30, 39 million for suicide prevention activities, 19 million of, of it targeted specifically at our special forces. These are but a few examples of our commitment to, the US, to U.S. military dominance across the air, land, and sea, our commitment to our allies and partners, our commitment to our service members, all volunteers, and their families. Mr. Chairman, I understand, all of us do, that Americans are weary after 13 years of war. Despite the proclamations of some that Al-Qaeda and its followers have been decimated, the American people must understand the reality that terrorism is actually spreading worldwide. Yes, our enemies have sustained serious damage, inflicted by the most skillful and powerful military intelligence organization on the globe. But in many cases, these enemies have adopted and grown to become even more dangerous. We are witnessing an alarming collapse in Iraq. The central government now controls less than half of its sovereign territory as it reels before a full-blown insurgency. The concept of an autonomous jihadi state or caliphate determined to attack the West is an unacceptable development that demands a response. We pivot elsewhere at our own peril. National defense is the priority job of the federal government. Our Constitution grants this Congress the full range of authorities for establishing the defense of our nation. Our task in this House is to ensure that our military is ready to respond when the Commander-in-Chief calls. This legislation moves us towards a state of current and future military readiness that will protect America and I urge its passage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves.